So we have been in a series called Bodybuilding, and over the, the past few weeks, we've been talking about passages of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in Ephesians 4, and we're going to go back to Ephesians 4 again today and look at some different things, but we've been talking about the importance of uh, the, the body of Christ and, and realizing that we're not just the family of God, but we're the, uh, the body of Christ and a body of believers, uh, and, you know, because of that, that level of commitment. You know, if your arm just decides to take a day off, how I many you know that's going to be a bad day? That's going to be kind of a rough day. Anybody who's ever broken an arm or, or suffered some type of injury, you know that when you're not able to use a part of your body, like it affects the entire body. And so we've been talking about realizing that every person that is part of this church is, is part of the local body. But not only that, but iHeart Church is just part of the, the, the corporate body of Christ. And many people wonder, well, why do you even go to the Dominican? Why do you do stuff in Honduras? Why do you do stuff? Because this is all part of the body of Christ. We're, we're there to build the body because there are people who are lost. There are people who are hurting. There, there are people who need Jesus. And, and, and we have that. And we have the answer. And we have the good good news of the gospel that can bring freedom into their life. And we're not just called to build our local body, but we're called to build the body of Christ as a whole. And it, it, it's time that we begin to really realize that, that we're just not a, an inactive part of the body. That every one of us have giftings, every one of us, that, that when we were in our mother's womb, that God formed us and created us with specific purposes and destiny and things that he hoped for us to accomplish. That when we go to church, when God leads us to a church and that church becomes our home church, that, that God is leading us to that church, not just so that we can go and be fed every week, not just so that we can go and, and our kids have a great children's ministry and, and be fed every week, but that so we could connect in and find our place in the body and begin to build the body, begin to, to reach, uh, uh, do, you do your part to help reach those that are lost. I mean, you think about it today, right now in the sanctuary, it's kind of quiet. But can you imagine if we had those 60 to 80 kids that are out there in that wing and all of them were in here climbing all over you and, and, and mom, 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 mom the whole time that you're trying to, to listen and stuff. Can you imagine how chaotic it would be in here? But because we have some people who are wearing these green shirts and, and, and black and green shirts that says, I heart kids, because they faithfully serve, then the kids are able to receive a message that they can learn about God on their level, but we're also able to have a few minutes where we're not being pulled on as parents, where we can focus, where we can hear from God. Every part matters. Every part matters. You, you know how I know every part matters? Nobody in this room ever thinks about the sound man until it starts squealing or they can't hear something. Come on, it, it, it matters. It, it, every little part that we have truly matters. And we need to realize that and not belittle what our part is. As we talked about in 1 Corinthians, the eye can't be upset because it's not a foot or, you know, all these things. But find your part, play your part, and build the kingdom of God. Today I want to talk about some benefits of uh, the, the body of Christ and how the body of Christ serves one another and, and how we build each other. The first thing is this, is that the body is supposed to strengthen the body. Now... I know all of y'all look at me and you're like, you know, Pastor Brandon, I know you, you obviously know about bodybuilding because you're so huge and you're so massive and like your arms are, are just big, you know, we, we, we can tell, we know that. So teach us about this, you know. I, I know that's the thoughts that were going through your mind and everything. But I, I'll just let y'all know, when I work out, <clears throat> the few times that it happens, <clears throat> Like, my arms, my bicep has never picked up a weight. My quads have never <clears throat> picked up a weight to strengthen my biceps or my quads. But you know what has? My hands have reached down and picked up weights. And then my hands, as I pull them up, my elbows bend, 
And as, as, as every part is doing their part, as my fingers are gripping, as my hand is holding, as, as I start to bend my elbow, then what does it do? It's strengthening my biceps or strengthening my triceps. It's strengthening the different areas, whatever weight that I'm doing it. The body is there not just for you, but to strengthen other parts of the body. You know, when, when you lift weights, if you're trying to strengthen your legs, you, you, don't just, uh, you, you don't lift weights with your legs. You don't just set a weight down on your quad and just start lifting it up and down with your leg. It's, that's not how it works. You take weights and you set them on your shoulders and you grip them with your hands and then you have to start bending at the knees. And as you do all of those steps and go down, you're strengthening the muscles. Every part is, is in, in, important to the other parts of the body. And if one part does, takes their day off, then the other part of the body isn't being strengthened in what it's supposed to be. Right. It takes my hands to increase my biceps. It takes my shoulders. It takes my hands. It takes my fingers to increase the, the strength that's in my legs. Every part is not isolated. We work together for the strengthening of the entire body. And every little part matters. And so when we don't do our part, we're not just hurting ourselves, but we're also preventing the body from being able to be built and being able to be strengthened and being able to accomplish what it's supposed to do. In Ephesians 4, it talks specifically about some some positions that help strengthen the body. It says that he gave us apostles and he gave us prophets and he gave us evangelists and he gave us shepherds or pastors and he gave us teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. So he, he says there's two purposes that he gave that, what's known as the five-fold ministry. The, the two purposes are, one, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You know who the saints are? It's not like St. Peter, St. Paul, you know, all those things where you have to perform a miracle and all those stuff before you achieve sainthood. A saint is someone who has received Christ as their Lord and Savior. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you're a saint. Some of you may be like, I feel like I need to repent right now for lying. Uh, but to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. One of the things that as we were sitting and talking with these Dominican pastors, like it blew their mind because they, they look at the American church and they see numbers and they see size and they, they know that there's money and there's resources. And so they automatically think, well, that means that the American church is healthy. And as I'm sitting with the American, the, the, these Dominican pastors, I sat with them and they were talking about, well, we're going to buy these electric guitars and we're going to buy this and we're going to buy this different stuff so that we can make. And, and I was like, can I tell you something right now? They were like, what? I said, you can take it or leave it, but, but I want to give you some information that I think you need to know. It's like, what's that? I said, don't Americanize your church. And they looked at me like, what? What do you mean? I said, what you have in here, they literally had drums that they had stretched a piece of leather out and created their own thing. They had the, a, a little piece of metal that it, it looked like a, a cheese grater, and they were taking like a, a metal thing, and it was back and forth keeping rhythm. They didn't, have a, they didn't have keyboards. They didn't have electric guitars. They didn't have any of those things. But you know what they did have? They had the presence of God, and they had passion in their hearts for worship. And I told them, I said, don't Americanize your church. Because what happens is we can have all these pieces and everything, and we've got the lights, and we bring them down, and we've got the screens, but there's many times that people just sit here like this in church. And we've got all the bright pieces that should create an environment for the presence of God to be there. And people go, this is my testimony. Man, we keep saying the same words over, like they couldn't come up with new words to this song. Like, this is my testimony. This is my testimony. And is Cassidy going to sing this again? I mean, like, we've already been singing this for three minutes. And here, when I was at the church, like, they worship for from 930 to about, like, 
10.30-ish. Then I got up and preached from 10.30 to about 11 o'clock. And then from 11 o'clock till 12.30, you know what they did? They went back to worship. No instruments. None of that. But passion. There wasn't one person looking at their watch. There wasn't one person worried about getting out of here. Rich would tell you, like, I mean, who sat back there and just saw people who didn't have all of the things, but they had the main thing. They had the main thing because they knew it wasn't about performance. They, they understood, like, they had their part in worship. They, they had the, one lady had a tambourine that only had one little thing left on it. But she wasn't going to stop. She beat that thing to death. <laughs> and it wasn't like in a bad, like disruptive type thing. It was in a passionate worship for her Savior. They just served. They, they just worshiped. They had passion. I believe they believed the words that they were singing. I had no idea what they were singing because it was in Spanish. <laughs> I had no clue. But they were connected in with it. They understood that this is my part. I, I, I'm here to worship God. I'm here to learn. I'm here to <clears throat> do my part in building the kingdom. That phrase there, building up, is the Greek word ukadome. And ukadome means this. It means the building up. Or more literally, it means spiritual advancement. Like, what are you doing to, when we build up, it's not just building up in numbers, it's building up in spiritual advancement. Are you taking ground for the kingdom of God? Are, are, is there maturity being gained as you, as you grow? There's so many people that stop at the point of salvation and that's it. God doesn't want to leave us at the point of salvation. He called us to be disciples. There should be some advancement. There should be some training. There should be some wisdom that's growing, some maturity that's growing, some, 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 uh, some spiritual muscle that's being developed by what we do. And unfortunately, in the majority of churches today, there's not a ton of spiritual advancement. Because people come in and they sit in the same seat week in and week out and week in and week out. And you know what? They leave struggling with the same sin, same struggle week in and week out. The same problems. But figuratively, what this word means is it means constructive criticism and instruction that builds a person up to become a suitable dwelling place of God. Now think about that. What does the scripture say? That, and, and I think it's 1 Corinthians 6. It says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? God's design is that as we are in church together, as we're in small groups together, that we're growing up in our relationship with God, that we're maturing to where we become a more suitable temple, a more suitable tabernacle for the presence of God to dwell. And it said specifically, an example is, is, is a place where the Lord is at home. Now think about that. You think about your life. Is your life a life where Jesus would feel comfortable if he was in it? Is your home a place where if Jesus came and sat and visited your home, he would feel comfortable in that place? Can I tell you something? If you're a believer, the Spirit of God is inside of you. He is inside of your home. But many of us don't acknowledge him. Have you ever went to somebody's house and you can tell you're not welcome? Like you got invited by somebody. But like the spouse didn't want you there. It was an inconvenience for them. Or, or, or you, you, know, you, you're, uh, you know, as a kid, you, you go over to somebody's house and they said, oh, my, my parents are fine with it. And then you get there and you can tell like they're not fine with it. And how many, you know, like it feels awkward. Like it's just that. 
or, or you're there and like the, the spouses are arguing and fighting the whole time and you're there for dinner and they're slamming things down and stuff and you're just like, you're not feeling very at home right now. Or maybe you go to a house and they open up the door and they let you in and then they never talk to you. Like you're just sitting there and you're like, they're just going around being busy doing their own thing not paying any attention to you, you don't know what to do, should I leave, should I stay, hey, is there anything I can do to help, no, no, we're good, okay, I'll just sit here then, but how many of us treat Jesus like that, that he's in the room, we don't even acknowledge him. Like, we're not, we're not spending time with him. We're not talking with him. We're not growing. Have we created an environment where God feels at home with us? And if we're not, then there's some bodybuilding. There's some spiritual advancement. There's some training that needs to take place in our lives. It goes on in verse 13, and it says, We do this until we have attained the unity of the faith. I mean, you know, we still got work to do. <laughs> we still got a lot of work to do. When there's so much competition and so much division within the church, across denominational lines, across racial lines, even across there's young people's church and then there's old people's church and then there's like, you, you know, all this stuff. You, you, you see all this. There's, there's a complete lack of unity. And it says, and, and of knowledge of the, the Son of God to mature manhood, to, to measure the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer uh, be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine or by human cunning uh, or by craftiness and deceitful scheme, schemes. Listen, guys, this is, this is what you're seeing in, in uh, America a lot, where people are adopting things that seem godly, but they're not. They're, they're, they're hearing things and they're making changes on what we accept and what we don't accept and, and all of these things based on uh, uh, by, uh, like one phrase versus based on what scripture truly teaches about things. Like we want the word of God to conform to what culture says versus realizing that culture should conform to what the word of God says. And much of it is simply because people have been deceived by things. And until we grow up, that's what he goes on and says, rather we need to be people who speak the truth in love, that we are to grow up. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, grow up. Turn to the one you chose to ignore and say, you definitely need to grow up. Some of y'all felt so much more comfortable telling your neighbor to grow up than you did telling them they were a saint. You need to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint which is equipped. Uh, each part is working properly and makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As I said earlier, in, in order to strengthen the body, in order for certain parts of the body to be strengthened, it takes other parts of the body functioning properly and doing their roles. We are interconnected. God placed us here to, to not overstress one part or another. You see, the older you get, when you start getting little nagging injuries, you start compensating and walking different ways or, or you do things and you, 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 uh, you, you start to change the way you run or, or, or things like that because you're just trying to take a little pressure off of an injury. And all it does is cause further injury because it's out of alignment. It's not lined up and functioning in the way that it's supposed to be. And when we walk out of alignment, then all we do is cause other parts of the body to hurt. It's not just us. We're all connected. And over and over and over it says that we are there to build each other up. We are there to speak the truth in love, build each other up in love. 
This is something that we haven't done well in the church. We don't, we don't do a whole lot of building up. We do a whole lot of tearing down sometimes. But not so much building up. You remember that word, oikodome, one of the, 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 the meanings of it, the, the figurative meaning was it was constructive criticism that would help bring maturity. Constructive means that it's building, not destructive criticism. When I, when I talk about the problems that we see within the church, I'm not trying to destroy the church. I'm trying to show the correction that we need to be so that we can build up and make the adjustments so that we can begin to come into alignment and function the way that we were supposed to function. We're not meant to tear each other down with our words. We're not meant to destroy people with our words. In fact, he goes on in, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 and he says, let no corrupting talk. Some translation says, let no unwholesome or, or no negative talk come out of your mouth, but that which is good for the building up as, as it fits the occasion so that it might minister grace to the person who hears. When people encounter you, and what you say to people, are you building them up or are you tearing them down? Parents, we have to watch this. Because if we correct our kids and their behavior by tearing them down and telling them how horrible they are and what, uh, what, what a failure they are and how disappointed you are in them and we tear them down, then, then they're going to look for somebody who will build them up and tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. We need to make sure that when we tell people and when we correct people with things, that we're not doing it in a way that, that destroys, that leaves them hopeless, that leaves them in condemnation and guilt, but we're doing it in such a way that leads them hope, that leads them into a desire to better themselves, that, that we're speaking up to people and building people up and not tearing them down. We are never meant to destroy one another. In fact, the second thing, that the body does is the body heals the body. Our physical bodies are created that when there's an injury in the body, that if there's a cut or there's a wound, that, that the body sends uh, blood, increased blood to, to that area. And that's why a lot of times an area that where there's a wound becomes red or it becomes inflamed or, or, or swollen and everything is because the body is sending the, the different types of blood cells and things that are there that are necessary to begin to fight off the infection, that are necessary to begin to, to form a scab to where it doesn't bleed out, that are necessary to begin to, to bring healing to the body. The physical body has been created in, in a way that it's able to heal itself when it's hurt. And the spiritual body is designed the same way. In our physical body, when, when there's infection, the blood cells go in. And, and even, even, even in that, that, after it fights off an infection, it remembers certain things and, and creates antibodies so that if you ever have that infection or that sickness again, now you know how to fight it off in the future. And it's that way within the body of Christ that we are meant to be there for one another, to help bring healing for one another, but not just bring healing, but also to learn from it that where if we, if we fell and we, we, we're broken in an area, that, that, that we can remember the, the way that we ended up in that place and, and, and we develop some, some spiritual antibodies to keep us away from those paths again that are going to lead to harm. And the Bible even tells us in James chapter 5 verse 16 he says that if we would just confess our sins one to another and pray for one another he says that, that you can be healed because the prayer of a righteous man has great power and it is, as it is working but in our church culture today we don't create an environment where people feel safe to be able to confess when they're struggling like if you look at the statistics of people struggling like with pornography or things, 70% of active churchgoers struggle with pornography. But yet nobody feels like they can confess that they're struggling with pornography. They feel like they got to hide it. And listen, 45% of women Within it. This isn't just a God problem. Yeah. 
struggle with, but we'll do a sermon and we'll talk about something like that. And then we're like, okay, if you're struggling with this, like we have to be vague in our altar calls because nobody would come if we're not. If I just said, okay, guys, if you're struggling with pornography, get up here, we're going to pray. Ain't nobody coming. <laughs> you ain't coming. If I said, you're, are, are you struggling with unforgiveness? It'd be full. So there's certain things that we feel like it's okay for us to confess, and, and we'll confess those things, and we find healing in it. But then there's other things that the enemy has convinced us you can't confess those things because if you confess that, they'll, they'll, they'll write you out. They'll pull you out of ministry. They'll fire you. They'll get rid of you. They'll, they'll all, you know, whatever. They, they just constantly are, it's, it's in this mindset that there's things that you can't bring to the light. And so, so many people don't find healing in those areas because we don't feel like we can confess them. Listen, we have to create a culture in which people can take off their spiritual mask and reveal, I'm broken. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I'm mad at God right now. I haven't read my Bible in months. Without judgment. And the way that that happens, everybody knows nobody's just going to stand up in front of a group this big and just say it in front of everybody. Nor does God necessarily want us to sit there and air your dirty laundry. So don't, don't go on Facebook when you leave here and just post all your sins and struggles there. Because all you're going to get is a bunch of haters that are going to jump in on you and start tearing you apart. But we have these cool little things called small groups. We tell you every week, scan the QR code and be a part of a small group. And yet people don't do it because they don't see the benefit in it. Well, part of the small group is that as we're joining together, we're strengthening one another. And another part of the small group is that if one of us are struggling or hurting, I've got other people that I can confess what's going on in my life so that I can see healing in my life. And so some people struggle with all these things in their hearts and lives and, and, and battle. And, and it's like, I feel like I'm all alone. Sign up for a group. I feel like I'm the only one who struggles with this. Get in a group, and I guarantee you will find out that you're not. Because the person to your right and to your left is every bit as messed up as you are. It just looks differently. Your pastors are messed up. I'm just letting you know, if y'all think y'all got a perfect church and a perfect pastor and stuff, you're wrong. Your pastor loses his temper and gets angry sometimes. Your pastor looks at things the wrong way and, and, and gets judgmental or critical. Your, your pastor struggles with things. Since I've been a pastor, there have been times as a pastor that I've looked at a woman with lust in my heart. Oh, <gasps> I'm leaving the church. Guys, if we can't create a culture where it's real, listen, God, 60% of pastors are struggling with the same areas of pornography and lust and things. But they don't feel like they can say anything because their church would be voting them out and getting rid of them. You can't vote me off the island. <laughs> we don't do congregational votes. But if you choose to leave because your pastor is imperfect and has failed time after time, there's times when I've held unforgiveness. There's times when I, 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 I should have said something and I didn't say it. There's times when I shouldn't have said something and I did say it. Just ask the referees at the basketball games. But if I don't, if, if, if I don't feel like I can confess that, 
Listen, I'm giving you the freedom. Your pastor just got up and told you how messed up he is. There have been times when I've been angry at God. There have been times when I'm like, God, I don't understand why you would do that. This doesn't make sense to me. Why? Do you not see? Like, there, there's times when there's been inner turmoil and struggle. There's been times where I'm like, God, is this even real? Can I tell you something? I'm just following an example. Paul in Romans chapter 7, says the things I want to do, I, I, I find myself not doing, and things I don't want to do, I find myself doing, and who will save me from this wretched body of death and all this. You know, Paul wasn't writing that when he was a new believer. This was 20 to 25 years in ministry, and he's still saying, I'm still messing up. I still do things that I don't want to do, and, I, and the things that I know I need to do, I'm still finding myself not doing it. Who's going to save me from this wretched body of death? I thank God that through Jesus Christ, he saved me. And so, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. See, some of you might think less of me now because I've said things that I struggle, have struggled with over the years. But some of you, I hope you see it as an opportunity. To re- if he can get up in front of people and it's on video and it's going on the internet and everybody's going to see it, then I surely can join a small group and I can get together with people and deal with what's going on in my life so that I can find healing. This is the way the body's supposed to work in Galatians chapter 6. It says that if anyone is caught in a transgression, those who are spiritual should throw rocks at them and condemn them and tell them how horrible they are. You heathens! You just need to pray more and read the Bible more. You just need to fast more and you just need... That sounds like a whole lot of you. Paul didn't say, the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing, and the things I I do want to do, I'm not doing. So I'm just going to have to pray and fast and intercede more and get an accountability partner and everything, and then I'm going to be able to overcome this. He said, who's going to save me from this? I already know who saved me. Jesus Christ already paid the price on the cross for me to be saved from this. And so I'm not walking in condemnation and shame anymore. I can be healed from it because of Christ. I'm, I haven't received the spirit of fear. I've received a spirit of adoption. I'm a son. I can cry out, Abba, Father. I don't have to run away from my God. I can run to my God. I'm his boy. I can cry out, Abba, Father. And I know that he hears me. And there's a warning that he gives there when we do this. He says, you need to be careful lest you too be tempted. But instead, bear one another's burdens. And so by doing this, you fulfill the law of Christ. This is what God wants in our life. You see, when we struggle with sin, we have one of two responses. Or when there's things going on in our life and we're weak and stuff, we have one of two responses. The first one is we isolate. We, 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 we try to pull away from people. But can I tell you something? Isolation just makes things worse. The Bible even tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 7, to, to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom it may devour. He's given the this, this, this strategy that the enemy uses. He's like a lion. A lion doesn't run up in the middle of a, of a herd of, of, of antelope or anything, that, or zebra. He watches for one that's isolating itself off. And then he begins to pounce on it. You know, in your physical body, there's sometimes when an infection would literally kind of begin to wall itself off to where antibiotics and things won't treat it because it's, it's, and it begins to form a boil or a pus and looks all nasty. And, and what normally could take a little bit of topical medicine or a little bit of antibiotics and be healed because it's walled itself off because it's isolated itself, now it's a much more invasive process to bring healing. You have to go and take a scalpel and lance that thing out. 
and all that mayonnaise, oozy, gooey junk, just foul smelling, ugh, just. Just hope when you pop it, it doesn't spray up and hit you in the eye, you know, just, y'all loving this. Can I tell you something? Isolating yourself only makes things worse. You're, you're building up walls and you think you're protecting yourself, but all it does is make things worse and make it harder for healing to take place in your life. Stop isolating yourself. You're not the only one. You're not the only one who's struggling. You're not the only one who fails. You're not the only one who makes mistakes. I'm telling you. The other response that we have is we're just going to take a break. I've been, been doing this ministry thing for a while, so I'm just going just to take a little break here, get some things worked out, all that. You know, there are times in our physical bodies where certain parts of your body need a break. You break an arm, what do they do? They, they take it and they cast it. Right? They support it. They, they strengthen it. How many of you know they don't leave that cast on indefinitely? There is a certain amount of time that they're going to leave the cast on. And then they're going to take the cast off and they'll x-ray it again to see if they need to cast a little bit longer or, or if it's good. And then they begin the, the physical therapy or whatever is necessary in order to re-strengthen it again and get it back functional again. But can I tell you something? There's been people who've been taking a break for years from Jesus. Some of y'all have been taking a break since COVID. Like I realized my, my, I was running at too, too fast of a pace and, and it was crazy and everything. So I'm just taking a break and it's just me and my family and we're, we're just going to get up in the morning and, and just watching online and all this and disconnect and everything. And it's just going to be us in our living room and all that. But you know what happens? It begins to some, one Sunday morning you sleep in, one Sunday morning something happens and you miss it. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to catch it later. I'm going to catch it later. I'm going to catch it later. And then three or four weeks ago and you haven't caught up with the one three or four weeks ago. And it, what, because it's, it's a slow fade of isolation for the enemy to just pull you out of the body. I believe there are times where people need breaks because they've allowed themselves to get unhealthy in a way. But when you put a cast on my arm, you don't detach it from my body. Right? That would be stupid. If your doctor ever says, you got a broken arm, we're going to cast it, and then we're going to cut it off. Find a new doctor. Don't go there. But that's the way we do it from the spiritual body. I just need a break. There's a lot going on in my marriage. There's a lot going on in my family. So I'm going to take a break. When are you coming back? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. When, when things are better. I'll be back when things are better. Can I tell you something? It ain't getting better. Because when you disconnect from the body, there's no blood flow. There's no healing. There's no other parts of the body that are strengthening you. There's no, there's no connection for you to be able to confess what's going on and work through what's going on so that you can bring healing. It's all a disconnection with the hopes of one day it's going to get better. But if you cut a part of your body off, if you cut your finger off and you just let it sit there, is it going to get healthier or better on its own? Josiah. Like, when you cut your finger off, and I had to go get the tip of your finger, the tip of your finger was already black after just a little bit of time. It was already dying. When we called the doctors and said, how are we 
you, you, can you reattach it? And so I was like, no, it's already dead. It's, it wasn't cut clean. It wasn't, like, it would have it taken a miracle. You had to be at the right place, right time, right surgeons, right everything for that to ever even function. It's, it's gone. But yet so many times we disconnect from the body and hope that it's not going to just dry up and die. It's not getting better when you're disconnected. If you need a break, take a break. But define the break. The same way, why do they not put a cast on for an indefinite amount of time? Because if you put a cast on and, and you walk around with that thing for six, nine months, a year, all the muscles that are supporting the cast are going to begin to atrophy and you're not going to be able to walk when they take that thing off. Because you've lost all strength to it. But if they only put the cast on for a short period of time and then when the, when the bone has been healed, then they begin to do physical therapy. What is that? That's intentional therapy that is targeting the muscles and things that are around the broken area so that it can bring healing. If we're so intentional about our physical body, about targeted healing and staying connected, and yes, having protection, but stay connected, and, and, we're, and then once we take the cast off, then we're gonna do these things to strengthen you. You don't get released from, like I tore my ACL, when they took the cast off, or when they took the brace off, they didn't just release me to go play basketball again. No, it took months where I was allowed to bend my leg a certain amount, and then I was allowed to do certain exercises, and then I was allowed to do this. And then over the course of six to nine months, then I was able to go and play ball again or go run again or do things. It's the same way when we take a spiritual break. It's not, I'm, I'm out, I'll see you guys later. When I get better, I'll be back. You ain't coming back. You never come back that way because it's not the way the body works. God created the body to help bring healing to the body. We need one another. We need connection. So if you've been on a break, it's time to get reconnected. Let's target this thing and let's, let's do the, the therapy necessary to strengthen you find healing so that you can begin to function the way that God created you to function so that the body is strong so that the body is healthy so that we can continue in the spiritual advancement that God has called us to do